Welcome back, honors. All right, so let's get after it. Let's go ahead and get this flip posted before the weekend actually starts so you can quickly and efficiently bang this thing out. All right, now let's go ahead and set our timer because I think I said I would try to keep this under 15 minutes, which should be very, very easy in and of itself. Uh, but we have a couple of things we have to talk about. We have to discuss the power of Louis XIV, right? How he was able to achieve that state of absolutism. Now, really quickly, not to confuse you even further, to some of you who are like, ah. now look, absolutism in Europe, it's an era, all right? So to kind of understand this in its whole and it's an enti in its entirety, absolutism was an era in history from about 1500 to about, give or take, 1650, we'll call it, all right? So about 1650, where kings tried to create absolute authority, right? Where they would have complete and utter control over their states with absolutely no one checking their power, right? Some of them did this successfully, like Louis XIV and a guy named Peter the Great that we'll talk about in Russia. Some of them did this unsuccessfully, like the Stuarts in England, right? Some of them did it successfully like Charles V. Some of them did it unsuccessfully like his son, Philip II, right? So it's just an era in time where all of these kings tried to grow their power to a state of absolute authority, right? And the best and most seminal one is Louis XIV, right? Louis XIV is the guy, right? He is the guy when we think of absolute authority as being the example we can point to and being like, that dude right there, He's got some power, am I right? Now look, so one of the biggest things about Louis that to understand is that he ruled from his house, right? So that big, beautiful palace that we looked at in class all day, we discussed is known as the Palace of Versailles with its over 2,000 rooms, with its over 7,000 pieces of furniture, some of them having gold inlaid on top of them, with its over quarter of a mile long building, with its massive gardens, its hedge mazes, its everything, and with its no bathrooms, right? It doesn't have a single bathroom in it, but we won't get into that right now. Uh, but look, the power of Louis emanated from that home because he actually ruled from there. He actually used it to limit noble power, right? So this was known as his royal court, right? Louis XIV had a party every day at his house. Every single night, he would have people over, he would have a joyous festivities, he would have a feast, he would have music, he would have a get-together where he, everyone would assemble in his hall of mirrors and they would all sit there and be like, oh, Louis, our son, king, our country revolves around you. And he had a huge council of princes and nobles that carried out his policies that lived at his house with him. That's right, over 300 noble families lived at Louis's house, right? They lived there and they would basically just be there to pamper him all the time, suck up to him and do whatever he told them to, right? This is what it looks like at Louis's house every day. This is the court of Louis XIV. We see Louis XIV right here in the direct middle of the image, right? And all of these nobles standing and flanking his sides, introducing one person who's coming in, almost as if they're being introduced to the entire French government, right? So, now the big thing, though, is you have to understand that Louis did this intentionally, right? He did this on purpose, to have this huge group of wealthy people that would do whatever he told them to, whenever. It's because he created them, right? He created a class of nobility, right? So we had two types of nobles in France. You had what's known as sword nobles and robe nobles, right? Now, the sword nobles, jot this down, the sword nobles were the old nobility. They earned their title through military service. Generations before them, their fathers had served in the military, or their grandfathers had served in the military, at one point or another, and had earned the title of a sword noble, right? And had lands entitled blessed upon them. Now, the sword nobility hated Louis. They hated his guts, right? They didn't think, like him at all. They were like, you're abusing our power. You're limiting our power. You're telling us what to do when we own lands and titles in our own right. We are supposed to have some power, right? The sword nobles hated him. And they were called sword nobles because they were the only ones in public, public, in public, in cities in French society, allowed to carry a weapon with them openly, right? They could carry a sword with them wherever they went, okay? But then you had the robe nobles, who were created specifically by Louis, right? 
Louis created these nobles because he hated these guys so much. These dudes actually tried to kill him when he was like four, right? When he was a little boy and he had just become king of France, these things known as the Frondi Rebellions broke out, where sword nobles led massive armies against the armies of the king, trying to get to him, kill him, destroy him, and install a government of their own, right? Actually, one time, apparently, Louis faked like he was sleeping when they broke into the, a palace called the Palace of the Tuileries whenever he actually lived in Paris still when he was little, and he pretended like he was sleeping, all these sword nobles got up to the edge of the bed, they're like, ah, oh. I can't kill that. And they left him alone, right? So, like, turns out, Louis hates the sword nobles just as much as he, they hate him, okay? So he creates robe nobles, okay? Robe nobles are nobles who were allowed to buy their way into the nobility. They are wealthy families who had made their money in one way or another who did not reach noble status yet. And he allowed them to purchase this noble status. And that are the, those are the people, my friends, who are assembled on these stairs. And you knew them by their glorious, very large robes that they wore, right? So you have to understand the difference between the robe noble and the sword noble, right? And the creation of the robe noble created that court that Louis wanted so much. They, all the people that did what he told them to, those were his robe nobles, right? The people that were standing next to his bed every morning when he woke up, those were his robe nobles. The ones who were clapping as he ascended downstairs to go eat his breakfast, those are his robe nobles. And he could easily just look at the robe nobles and be like, go to Marseille and place a tax on any foreign in shipments of wine. Now! And the robe nobles would run off and do it, right? Because they felt honored to be in the presence of the sun king who had blessed them with noble authority, right? They would suck up to him, okay? Now the big thing, though, also you got to understand is that Louis is an uber-Catholic. He destroys Huguenot churches, he revokes the Edict of Nantes, and he begins a persecution effort against the Huguenots again, the thing that his grandfather tried to stop, Henry IV, right? Which is very important to understand. This is another element of his absolutism. He just didn't like them, so he wanted to what? Destroy them, right? So he didn't like them at all, even though ironically enough, this is going to negatively affect the economy of France because it's going to run a lot of these Huguenot merchants out of town. They're going to go to places like Italy and the Holy Roman Empire, and they're going to make their money there instead. And that actually ends up sending France into some debt. We'll get to that here in a second. Hmm. Now, another big thing, though, that you have to understand are some of the economic policies that Louis adopted. His financial gains and the way his finances worked are very, very important, okay? He spent the entire French budget, let me say that again, the entire French budget on himself, his palaces, funding his royal court, and jot this down over here, funding wars, right? So he was constantly at war, okay? If you jump down here to this little stat, he started more wars than you can imagine, okay? For 54 years of his adult reign, he was at war for 33 of them. Like, I mean, like, that is wild, right? That is wild. For 54 years of his adult reign, without his queen regent, without his chief minister, he was at war for 33 of them, okay? That's over half, okay? Like, that's insane. That means that over half of his life, he was leading a war. Wars cost money. It's going to end up depleting the French royal reserves, right? He's also, though, going to adopt this policy known as mercantilism, right? Jot that down. Highlight that word. Very important. It is a fill-in-the-blank question, right? Mercantilism is the economic concept adopted by absolutists because they're dumb. All right, so now mercantilism is a fake, non-real economic principle where you try to export more than you import, which means you're selling more than you're buying, right? And you also try to just grow as much money as you possibly can, okay? Because add this to this definition, mercantilism hinges upon the principle that money is a finite concept, that there's only so much of it in existence in the world. Well, Louis, that's dumb. And I don't care if your advisor, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, told you that it was a good idea, because money is anything. You make money up out of nothing. We, do it, we make it out of linen and cotton now, you know what I mean? Like, you make money out of anything, as long as somebody has faith that it is worth something, right? Now, this is going to grow some wealth temporarily, though, because gold reserves will run out, okay? Because he's trying to do so much and also finance these palaces and build these things and fund these wars, so it is going to run out, okay? And he tries to increase tariffs, too, which are taxes on imports. He tries to make it so the French people have to buy French goods. And when he died, the French state was in tremendous debt. Okay? And he died from an unfortunate infection around his hindquarters. Now, anyway, so we'll discuss that in class. 
But the big thing about it, he dies with a tremendous amount of debt and leaves France terribly in debt, okay? Now, that's important because this is going to come up again later, okay? The fact that he does die with a tremendous amount of debt, right? So, absolutism looked good on the outside, but internally, it's just a really bad system. It doesn't make any sense. No one person should be able to rule over the lives of millions, right? Now, what we're doing, though, do me a favor, right? In all capital letters, Russia, all right? So, we are now discussing Russia, all right? We are going to be discussing Russia and its attempt at absolutism. And the reason why it's so important is because when Russia tried to do their absolute state, it's going to make them a legitimate contender as a powerhouse in Europe, okay? Because it's going to make them European, right? Like literally like Russians were considered Eastern all the way up until this point until an absolutist comes along by the name of Peter the Great. And he actually is going to create this idea known as Russian absolutism, right? Because you have to understand, it all hinges around this guy, okay? Now look, in Russia, jot this down, jot this down, write this first. In Russia, the Mongolians controlled Russia during the Middle Ages, okay? So the Mongolians in the Mongolian Empire under the Khans, is what they're known as, as in Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan, controlled the Russians for an excessive amount of time, okay? Now then, around the 1300s, Russian nobles are going to begin to break away, okay? One of those famous nobles is known as Ivan III, Grand Prince of Moscow, right? At the time, it wasn't even called Russia. It was called Muscovy, right? So, and the big thing you got to understand is that during this entire time period, Russia is growing its power, right? And they're under this dynasty known as the Rurikid dynasty, right? So write this really quick. As of the 1400s, Russia was controlled by the Rurikids. And the Rurikids are spelled R U. R-I-K-I-D-S, okay? That is who's going to be in charge. And the Rurikids still heavily clung to the feudal system, right? Russia was still very large and still clung to its feudal system, okay? They depended on nobles to run lands for them and a lot of other different things until this dude comes to power, right? And his name is Ivan Ivan, no, Ivan Vasilyevich. Or in Russian, he is known as Ivan Dugrozny. All right, so like, say that with me really quick. Ivan Dugrozny. All right, so Ivan Dugrozny is known in Russian as Ivan the Terrible. All right, so now he is the very first leader to consolidate, which means to unite, the power of the nobles under one government, right? He pulls all of them in and begins to strip their power away from them. He centralizes the government, and he is named as the very first true czar of Russia, okay? So if Russian absolutism starts with this guy. Now, he got close to being an absolutist, but a big problem was he didn't have the technology to rule over an entire state like Russia because it was so large, right? So, but he centralizes his government, and he names himself czar, right? And a czar is a Russian king. And why do we think it's spelled C-Z-A-R? Well, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> That's right. Caesar, right? So that is why it's known as a czar, right? So now the big thing, though, you have to understand is he did not, he creates an absolute government, even though himself kind of was an absolutist. But don't worry about the semantics. I'm never going to ask you, did he or didn't he? I'm just talking about this in the big trend of everything, right? But Ivan IV comes into power and he begins to strip power away from the nobles right? He strips the power away from them, which is a big reason why he was referred to as Ivan the Terrible. The boyars and the nobles thought he was terrible. He's going to create an absolute government, and his dynasty is going to live on until it dies out in 1613, and the Romanovs take over, right? And the Romanovs are going to rule Russia from 1613 to 1917, all right? So shout out, Riley. I know you're a big fan of the Romanovs, but we will get to them later. But I'm going to leave you here, okay? And then we'll talk a bunch of this stuff in class, and then we'll go over Peter, and we'll be done, and then we'll get ready for your test, okay? Y'all have a good one. Have a great weekend.